thank you for those kind words and, um, and thank you for the invitation. Some of you might have heard my presentation, so I won't be upset if you uh, want to go out and have a drink. And <laughs> um, But hopefully there's a few of you that uh, might want to keep on listening. So thank you. I'm just going to share my screen now. How's that working? Yes, sir, it's fine. Fine, excellent, excellent. So I'm just losing my green screen. There we are. Okay. Um, so it is confidential, and I presume everyone here is working with forensic odontology. Um, when uh, victims are uh, deceased, they, the, there's legal reasons to identify them, but also families need to have their moment of grief. Uh, they need to have their funeral services or memorial services to actually receive closure. And without this closure, you get a depression and, and actually can lead to uh, chronic depression, which can also lead to suicide. The prolonged grief, there's articles showing that this depression can lead to cardiovascular disease, as well as other points I'm going to show later. Um, and these can be from antidepressants, the alcoholism, uh, the taking of drugs, and the worst thing, as I said, is the 15, 15 times more likely to commit suicide if you have some similar sort of trauma, and that includes mental trauma. Now, it's obviously important not only to identify is to make sure that the bodies are correct. So um, it's nothing worse than finding there's been a mix up. So this is where we're, our work is just so important here. The, um, it even happens with um, our return soldiers where they've actually had a mix up in one of the return soldiers. And uh, that was extremely embarrassing, not just funny for the government, but for the family, they, they were really depressed about it and it was quite upsetting. So we have a, a reason to do this. Uh, this is in, when I talk about incineration, I'm talking about where the fire brigade hasn't had a chance to put out the fire. So the bodies that have deceased have been subjected to intense heat for over at least an hour. And this intense heat can lead to problems with the identification. And in the past, you've seen lots of media reports where it's been people have been burnt beyond recognition. So hopefully after today, um, we can think maybe some of these cases aren't, aren't really true. Uh, an example of the Nigerian tanker fire where a petrol tanker overturned, the petrol flowed into the ditch and people started collecting the free petrol. Unfortunately, there was ignition. And as you can see, many of these bodies were severely incinerated. Unfortunately, they didn't have the resources to identify these people. So an excavator was brought to the site and um, these bodies were damaged and transported um, into a big ditch and they weren't identified. The problem with that is that uh, this leads to this chronic depression I was talking about. Perhaps, you know, their relative wasn't there that day. Perhaps he just went on to the next village and there's some chance that he wasn't there. And this Every day people were waking up thinking, lingering doubt, thinking, well, maybe he, he'll turn up and maybe we'll just walk through that door. The reason why they're saying burnt beyond recognition is the evidence is not very good. There's a lack of visual, so there's no tattoos, there's lack of fingerprinting, and medical devices, severely charred, dental, which we're going to talk about the fragility, and DNA had problems with degradation over 250 degrees. An excellent article here where the Teeth, once they get to the orange coloration, coloration, then it's very difficult to actually get any sort of DNA um, to match. Um, this is, they found this out in the Grenfell Tower in London, where the fire brigade obviously couldn't go to us, only to a certain height. And then the media was quick to pick this up, that the London fire might have destroyed the DNA. Um, so most of the identifications were by dental. In again, the Victorian bushfires, which I attended, which I attended to, um, this bar here is dental, and this is DNA. Most of the identifications were done by dental. However, we we've had problems uh, with that. Uh, you can see here this is an incinerated tooth, and there's a you can might see just that little bit of white lining, which is often underneath an amalgam filling, which is obviously melted and has perished. However, you can see that tooth is relatively intact, but a slight knock and you lose all that information. If the crowns have been lost, we can still identify them using the morphology. And what I mean by morphology, I'm looking at how long are the roots in comparison to each other? How much bone is there between the roots in comparison to each other? Where are the apices in comparison to each other? 
and looking at the angles, the shape and the fitness, so, and the size. So by, by looking at all these morphology points, we can actually get some ideas that the person, and then we can actually um, look at the comparison with the anti-mortem radio route. The, um, the problem with the Victorian bushfires is that we did very successful identifying, but it took us over three months. And I'm just gonna show you, highlight the points that are the problems. Here's a, um, a head, I hope you can see there, uh, uh, incinerated at the scene, and there are some teeth in all in position, especially on the mandible there. But with the transportation to the mortuary, everything starts to fall apart. And then we have to sort out what's what, and we're left with certain bits and pieces there. So we've lost all that morphology information we had. Uh, you can see there's a maxilla intact. Uh, we've lost maybe a couple of teeth there, but a fair bit of the, the uh, teeth are just intact there. However, again, it just falls apart by the time we get to the mortuary. Uh, this third case is a car accident, and this highlights why it's important to, before you do anything, is to take a photo. Uh, this is sitting in a car, there is an upper four missing. So that, that victim's upper four is actually missing, which is, can be a point of interest, even if it's a possible, um, it's some sort of information. Again, though, by the time it came to the mortuary, it was all little bits and pieces. So what we do then is we actually try to put it all together. Now, how good is your dental anatomy, especially the roots? Um, so before we had certainty at the scene, now we're just giving our opinion how we think fits together. And this is a lot degrading the evidence that we've got. So we need some more certainty than just starting to put things together and thinking this is how it all fits. So stabilization is important at the scene. Um, these are some of the parameters I set out. One of the most important things is that it's still radiolucent because quite often it's hard to see anything unless we take x-rays. And so we've experimented using pigs, and incinerated them. Eventually it was easier just to use sheep mandibles. And in here, we've Dr. Falsey from Indonesia. And you can see here, we've got some restorations. We just put them anyway, obviously these aren't normal, but just putting fillings into teeth and then spraying to see if it all fit. Um, we then put in a vibrating plate and we found that it's extremely, um, extremely effective in keeping everything remained. We had to do a couple of different groups because the formula of the actual spray paint had changed. This is clear gloss enamel and it's quite easy. It's easy to obtain at the hardware store. You can just spray it on the top. However, uh, what's in clear gloss paint is as well as acetone, there's toluene, xylenes and C3-O-matics, which in petrol, you have toluene, xylenes and C3-O-matics. So if this is a murder scene where someone's put on volatiles, to, uh, or accelerants to burn that person, um, we've actually gone and contaminated the scene. So, um, or even just even a suicide has that person poured petrol over themselves. So we've ruined that if we uh, go and spray paint. So, but in a large disaster where that where it's actually obvious, then um, spray paint would be quite an obvious thing to use. Water-based paint still has the xylene and sea aromatics because they're still based from the petrochemical industry. Hairspray has a lot of ethanol in it. Cyanoacrylate um, is very effective in holding things together. It has toluene and methylmethacrylate, but instead of spraying, you could actually just use it on the uppers and sizes, um, but I'll talk to that in a sec. Ethanol and PVA, which is the wood glues. But what I found it very effective was wheat paste. So this is just flour and water and um, heated up gently and um, diluted with water and you could spray it on the heads. And we did that um, experimentally, and we found that flour and water spray works extremely well. Um, you, how to make it, I won't, it takes a while to explain a bit there, but it's just mainly just heating it and diluting it and add salt because you want, and vacuums keep it. So that way it actually doesn't come moldy while you're waiting for a, victim, for a disaster to occur. It's all available on, on a YouTube, just look up any sort of wheat paste, how to make wheat paste, it's available. Um, radiographically, it didn't interfere. You can still see the x-rays, the um, restorations in there. And so we then moved on to human heads, uh, which uh, bodies that have been donated to the cadavers, been donated to science. Once the dissection students have finished, I uh, incinerated them. And in this video, I've got the two, the mandibles cut in half, and I've got one half that hasn't been sprayed, and this half has been sprayed, and this is placed on a vibrating plate. 
So you can see as it's placed in the vibrating plate, you'll start seeing the set vibrate. And this side on the other side, don't fall off. And even if you turn it upside down. So we did a few heads like this, just to test them to see what holds together. So quite effective. And the reason why it works is as well as spraying over the top, also the setting material goes between the teeth. So as you set, make a bridge across the crack, this doesn't propagate any further. So by just spraying over the top and getting it down across the major cracks, the dehydration has stopped because the fire is out. And this, if you hold this together, further movements won't allow this crack further. You can heat up the flour and water with um, the old fashioned um, floodlight, uh, which gives a gentle heat and that heats it up very much, uh, a little bit on the side here. So it just goes to show spray on the head and just use a bit of light to allow that to set. The, the problems though, when I went working out in the field and in one year I had 14 um, field exercises with people incinerated, um, the volatiles, there was said earlier, there was a contamination of volatiles if we, if we use the paint spray. Some stabilizing agent like spraying super glue would be extremely dangerous and also very difficult. And also I found with the flour and water is that stabilized agents were not setting at the lower temperatures. So some of the fires actually were, were car fires and um, it was moist and wet and it was very difficult to get it to set. So um, Topoleski and Christensen from America, the FBI, they've been trying gelatin with, in their anthropological studies. So I decided to try with tea. Now, this is, um, gelatin is available from many different animals and all over the world. It's easy to get some crystals to use. Um, it's very easily available and it's very cheap. By just mixing, I found the six grams to 100 mils of water, which is like a teaspoon to nearly half a cup of water. Just you need to stir it vigorously though to, to um, get it to become soluble. And then you can spray it onto the heads. So again, testing on sheep mandibles, you can see how hot that is with the uh, bits of enamel coming off there. And I'm just gonna show you this video. This half is obviously in spray and I've added some extra crystals, but there's no need actually really to do that. But again, on a vibrating plate, you can see the teeth start falling apart as the cracks go into the bone and the teeth start falling together. So you can see the teeth are quite long, but they easily fall out if the cracks occur. Um, results, um, I had, did this, you can see 31 degrees. We tested all different temperatures from 18 to 31 degrees Celsius, and it was extremely effective. Uh, taking x-rays off the mandible with gelatin on it, it wasn't um, deteriorate. Well, it doesn't didn't interfere with the uh, X-rays. It was all the you can see the cracks are quite clear, and also the um, crowns are quite clear. And, and Adelaide, we've but fortunately got a testing uh, facility with the uh, fire services where we actually can put pigs' heads or sheep heads into uh, houses and experimental houses and actually burn them down. And um, sometimes the fire brigade sprays it, and we can actually video it. And also we have uh, temperature sensors up on the wall. We can follow that through and see the temperatures go. Now I just digressed here a little bit. Sometimes the fire brigade are there uh, fairly soon. Um, and we also don't have anti-mortem. Sometimes we don't have anti-mortem, which I think we're gonna have to talk to next. Uh, we can use photographs, even though Interpol don't accept um, just purely relying on photographs. But you can see you get a lot of information here just with one photograph. The, how this um, central is placed lingually and you've got this labially placed. You can see the, the angulations of the teeth. You can see that this is possibly a crown. And if you get an incineration case you, um, where it hasn't been burnt that long, the lips pull back and you can see quite clearly the, the teeth. The problem is again, even though you can see it quite clearly and the rest of it aren't that burnt, any knock and you've lost that. So. I recommend just putting a little bit of cyanoacrylate across those, across those teeth. Uh, careful not to spread it down to the lower jaw, it'd be quite difficult to separate the jaws. But just, it's very important because you may not know what anti-mortem information you've got. So it might be a bit confusing. So I've created a little table of what to use in different situations. Short burning time, cyanoacrylate on the upper teeth. Where no testing is required like a large um, disaster, uh, you can use the clear gloss enamel spray paint. 
high temperature, low humidity, you can use a wheat paste, but in most situations, the gelatin solution is the way to go. Um, so just going to show a, a car accident where it's been burning severely, just reach in. I placed a, my hand through there and sprayed backwards. And this is the skull down the bottom here, just to place it underneath and you can hold it all together. And you can see how fragile some of these cases are. This whole crown is, is, is actually separated and it actually started to move backwards. Now, if this wasn't held together, you can imagine you probably will lose some of these restorations. You can see the restorations are getting close to totally melted, but the, with the anti-mortem, you can see here, we were able to look at, look at and, and, and do analysis on these restorations. So just gonna talk a, a bit about the scene. Um, so forensic exam teams want to, a reason why attending the scene is to explain the event and identify the victims. Um, forensic odontologists and anthropologists aren't needed when it's, the body's really intact. It's just a police matter and fragmented remains that are actually pretty good at picking up. But once we get down to incinerate and some saying burning for at least an hour, it's very important that forensic odontologists attend because we, we know what incinerator remains look like. We're able to identify the parts and um, even had one two weeks ago where in our state where it was incinerated and the police fortunately picked up some uh, dental remains, even though they thought that wasn't part of the dental remains. So it's very important that we attend the scene so we can actually identify and, and to pick them up. Um, it will deteriorate with time, but a hurried response leads to evidence destruction, confusion and contamination. So you need to work, we need to work with the police, had a stand operating procedure. And um, this way we work in a most efficient coordinated way. And the way to do it is to speak to the coroner to say, this is what we can do. We can do this, but we need to work with the police and allow the police to work with them. When you're going to do it, you need a prepared scene bag. So that way you've got everything there. You don't, you won't go around running around trying to collect everything and you can arrive at the scene more promptly. Most importantly is to document everything down. So when someone writes, when someone rings you, you need to write down who rang, what, at what time, have you've got all your equipment there? Have you got your um, overnight bag if needed, first aid kit? And um, I even take the, sometimes the camera and an X-Pod as well. How are we gonna to get to the scene? What are the hazards that were uh, uh, present at the scene? When you arrive at the scene, so we need to write that down, who rang and whatever, and the date and time and place. And then when you arrive at the scene, again, write this all down. Because when it comes eventually to the inquest about what happened, all the information's there. You think you might remember it, but you won't. So it's important to have this all documented. Um, equipment, you need to wear good sturdy boots because there's a lot of dangerous material on the ground, sharp glass and um, bits of metal as well, and even hot or mud um, debris down the base. Uh, I like to have a, um, a beanie with a light and that keeps your hands free. So um, both hands are then free in case it's unstable terrain. You also need goggles because even though it may not be windy, there's sometimes a, a quick wind will blow up and you've got embers flying around as well as dust. You need good protective gloves as well as your examination gloves, good thick leather gloves to remove some of the debris over the top. And all the material will be down on the ground. Um, that structure that was there first, you'll have to be sitting down on the ground, you'll be kneeling down. So you want to protect your knees with something thick and will support it, keep you away from the glass. Take your own food and drink supply because probably won't be supported in the scene. Um, when you arrive at the scene, you need to consult with the actual scene commander. You can't just run in there and, and go for it. You, and they will give you a, a, usually a debrief of what's happened and, and also give it a path to enter and discuss the safety problems. Um, and these are some of the initial safety issues. And um, as well as the broken material, you can have loose wire, falling debris, and chemical fumes. So if you enter into a building, you need to wear a good start hard hat to make sure the falling debris is not there. That was seen in the Grenfell Towers. We can see in these shots where the, the fire brigade are protecting their heads because there's still falling debris. You never know when a wind comes up and something might fall. Again, electrical wires, you're gonna be electrocuted. And in Australia, we've got these mallee trees where the, um, there's continuation of burning um, at the base of the trees and these limbs can actually fall down. Inside a building, um, one that happened last year was actually the floor was pretty um, burnt as well, and it's unstable. 
you can see the head of the victim there. So it's all also as well as removing, retrieving the body once stabilized is to retrieve the remnants of what's underneath because it's highly likely a lot of the dental structures might have fallen down. Um, it could have been asbestos, you could be wiring, and again, you could have roof coming down on you. Some of the toxic substances, as well as toxic, toxic um, gases, there could be carcinogenic gases there. So it's, um, you'll have to think about it. If it's, if it's totally enclosed, you really need wearing breathing apparatus and the fire brigade have to help you out there. The carbon monoxide is one of the worst because if um, you need monitoring to have a look at the level, and these are alarm monitors. So um, if the carbon monoxide gets too high, you, you could be in danger. So at 3,200 parts per million, um, you're gonna get a headache and dizziness and nausea in five to 10 minutes, and you'll be dead in 30 minutes. Hemoglobin uh, attaches to oxygen extremely, uh, into carbon monoxide extremely well, 200 times better than oxygen. So even if you've got, you've gone outside, it might be too late. So you, as soon as you get any sort of headache and dizziness in any situation, you wanna be out of there. Now, when you scan the scene, it looks like a, a fair bit of mess. Um, there'll be debris everywhere, there'll be wires, the metal everywhere as well. And you can see this is the skull cap. This is what you tend to look for. And there's in the skull cap, there's definitely that suturing pattern that you can easily spot. And quite often the teeth are uh, just down there underneath. So there's the, max, the maxilla and there's a loose tooth there and a bit of the mandibles down the, down the bottom there. When you um, retrieve the body, um, put bubble wrap and a paper bag over the top to keep it all together. And then individual dental pieces, you might want to put in little jars protected by gauze or bits of towel and also um, gathering up the other information. So in gathering up, you need to like this underneath this car, sweep the base and see what you can find because it all can be taken to the mortuary and sorted out. Uh, thanks to Zaf Khoury, he sent me this, this little piece of information. It looks like a maxilla um, and it looks like a central and a lateral. When taking a radiograph of it, you can see this is deciduous, central and lateral. And by taking a radiograph, we can see the eruption of the, of the formation of the premolars and you can see the position of that central. So that way, what we can do is even, there may not be dental reference, but we can actually do an age estimation. So that person had the two premolars forming, the central straight underneath. So we're looking at about six and a half plus or minus one year. So this is using Sakir's um, El Katani um, er, um, eruption patterns and age estimation. Cobalt chrome, um, in my experience, they don't seem to melt. Uh, those, they really need to get a high temperature for them to, to even uh, slightly um, warp. So you might have burning of the teeth, uh, burning of the acrylic teeth. However, the structures remain. And you can then go through what teeth were present in the mouth. So we can see that this upper left lateral was missing. We had the canine. So you know, the lower arch, four to four. And then you look up something like Odonto search. We can then have a look to look at the pattern of what teeth were present. Probably not enough to identify, obviously, but enough to say probable or possible. Again, um, dental implants, extremely resistant to fire. And remember to look um, down underneath the head. In this case, in this fire, yeah, there was a Maryland bridge, which was um, very important in the identification. Again, this is a large bridge. And looking at the anti-mortem, you've got this pattern here. And it's quite clear. And even the sharp edge and the little um, across inside and the large pontic was quite clear. And um, sometimes you can find fixture devices. So even this is the edentulous mandible, this fixture appliance uh, can gather a lot of information if you've got the anti-mortem. Uh, a mandible with the teeth gone, still very important because you, by taking an x-ray, again, you can look at the morphology of the roots because of the sockets are there. So you can look at how the roots one against the other, where the apices finish, what teeth actually were present. So it gathers a lot of information. So just because there's no teeth or roots, it's still valuable. Uh, the dislodged crowns, very difficult to see anything when they're, when they're burnt. However, again, take a radiograph and you can see there's an upper molar with amalgam in it and the upper central with a um, resin in there. 
And so you go to the missing person to see who had a missing, uh, who had a um, central with the resin and an upper molar with an occlusal amalgam in it. Again, roots might show as well as the morphology, you might be lucky and get a root filling. Um, root fillings can change with, time, with the heat, but at least you know that's been root filled. So you're just gonna be careful. They will change because actually the gutter perk will also melt. You can see how fragile some of the teeth are. So sometimes uh, we take actually x-rays at the scene using the MyRay um, x-ray device and a portable x-ray unit. So you can see the crowns are gone, but it's been stabilized, but still sometimes it's a good idea to take a radiograph of it. When you're taking a radiograph, try to get the teeth in, in the position that they would most likely to be in the mouth. So there's no use laying that premolar at, to the side where the where an x-ray is very unlikely to be able to do a comparison to an anti-mortem. This is these are little bits of black foam that's holding the, the root and the tooth exactly in the in the position you expect it to be in the mouth. And that way you can then do a ladder comparison. Other information that you might find around the heads as people, as incinerations occur, as a fire attending, the people tend to protect their heads and you'll find, you know, watches and earrings around the head. So this may have dropped on the bottom. Um, it could be uh, hooped earrings as well. Um, you can see here also, once you've wrapped the head and transported it, transport it with a board underneath. So you need to supply a board underneath because you can see all that head and all the material is now down in the center and that movement might have destroyed everything. So you need to move the body with a support. And I like to also um, stay around until the person who's gonna pick up the body, talk to the driver to say, to be extremely careful. Uh, this, is, this is what I'm really important. This is really important to me. And to ring the mortuary to say, what's the condition of the body in the bag? Well, the mortuary technicians don't realize because the, the body is actually sealed. So it's important that you ring them to let them know. Uh, so I just write down as well as um, that it's incinerated. I also sometimes write the position of the body in the car or vehicle, like passenger left, etc. You can see they were doing this now in the States. Um, I won't take this away from the others who are also talking about CT scanning, but you need a thick, thick enough slice to get all the information. You can see this doesn't look like the top. Yet this is all one person, but I'll leave that to the experts if people got more expertise than me. So in, in summary, work with the police for safe access and train with them, um, search for minimal disruption. So you need to take photograph and document in evidence in situ before you do anything to disrupt it. So before you spray, before you move anything around, take, a, take the image, take the photo first, then spray the remains, collect the evidence, again, photograph and document, to show what condition they were when you, when you picked it up and then protect that body for transportation. So thank you. Um, this is in our state, the island, Kangaroo Island was in um, fair, but it was incinerated and you can see the destruction there. That's amazing nature. One year later, it's starting to grow back. Thank you.